Hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to speak. And I apologise in advance. If some people, I know there's a few people who have seen me speak before, there will be some repeat things that they've seen before. But I have to do a certain part of my talk because it puts the thing in context and then you'll see all the different words. So this is my mantra I have had for 10 years. It's a Chinese proverb, make happy those who are near and those who are far will come. And at the very end, I'm going to show you something that I'm doing in Hong Kong th in November which um, links the whole thing together. Um, for me, the more and more work I do, the more and more uh, um, where I come from, my family, how I was brought up means so much to how I think about my work. And this is my family. Um, I had circus family, uh, great-grandparents. Well, my great-grandfather was, um, was born in the workhouse in Farringdon, and then he escaped to the circus. And this is my great-grandmother, and she was German. She escaped to the circus and became a high diver. And this is my French grandmother and my French grandfather, great-grandfather, who was a salon painter in Paris. And that's my father. He was a, a musician, and his brother was a musician and played the viola and the violin. But my great-grandmother, actually, is quite incredible because when she went to the circus, they didn't really know what to do with her. I think that's what, you know, people ran away and they, they just ended up at the circus. They had to find something for them to do. So she became a high diver. And I'd only, I didn't, I always thought she was just like on a trapeze or something. I didn't actually realise until I watched some film on a Sunday afternoon caravan or carnival that this is what she did. And I think that's quite a brave, so she was quite brave, so I think that's why there's quite strong women in our family. And you just go in a very small plunge pool. So that was a brave woman. Anyway, they came to Holloway. Holloway in London is quite, um, it hasn't really changed ever. It's a very migratory area. It's, um, it's, it's very working class. It's, um, it's quite hardcore. It's changing. It has changed a bit, but I was brought up there in, in the 60s, and, um, and our family lived in two houses, and my dad had, was a musician, and my mother was a textile artist, but they didn't really have any money, and um, so and my dad didn't really believe in buying houses or anything, so we were all three in the same bedroom, and, uh, and I was the middle child. So I think I just wanted to have space in my life. And, um, and I was always a bit of an outsider at school. I didn't fit in. When we went back home again, it was different. People spoke French in our house and things like that. And I went back to school in Holloway, and everybody was Cockney, so I wanted to speak Cockney. And um, so, it, so I, never, I felt like I fitted in at home, but I didn't really feel like I fitted in anywhere else. And, um, so I sort of felt like I had to find my own way and what suited me. And even when I went to St. Martin's, the Royal College, I didn't quite fit into the course that I was doing. I was always doing other things, designing opera sets and things like that. So I spent, so I've just been on my own sort of journey in, the, in my own way of what I wanted um, to get. Oh, I forgot to put <laughs> the timer on. That wasn't very good. I'll be going on forever. Sorry. Um, uh, I, you know, I just want to, I, I've just been on this, I've just been trying to find what, what was, what, what, where was my place in life? Where, why was I doing what I was doing? And then, um, and I had a studio and I liked it, but I got bored. And, and then finally, um, in 2005, I um, looked at this building and I just realised that that's what I had been looking for all my life. I'd been look it wasn't about children and it wasn't about loads of friends, it wasn't about anything, it was about space and the space that I could do whatever I wanted to do in it and, and I can have anything around me and it was just, that was for me, that was my sense of belonging. And so then after that, when, and then when you do understand where, what, where you are and what, what, where your place is, then you start thinking about how do other people find their place? What does belonging mean to them? And so then really for the last 10 years, that's what I've been trying to do is find, working out how to make work that people feel like they belong to or it belongs to them or you know, work in communities and various things like that. So, um, but how I got, the, it's getting more and more that way. Earlier on, um, this was the changing point for me. This is in 2012. I didn't really understand when I was given this project 
I nearly didn't do it because I couldn't come up with an idea. Um, I didn't understand what this would mean to me, but I was given this space just out in Greenwich. For, it was a developer, it was a meanwhile space, and it, the Olympics were happening, and they said, well, I, we want a cafe here, just make this, make a piece of work. And I couldn't come up with anything, and then one afternoon, the person who commissioned me just said, if you don't come up with something now, you're going to um, lose the project. So I went home with desperation, and then I just made... Um, I was working with the poet Lem Cizé, and I looked at one of his tweets, and this tweet um, just inspired me. There was something about it. It was about chance meeting. It was, there was something that was magical to me, and I just then made this structure. I made a model. I made this structure, and I put all the type on, and I did it, and I don't know where it came from, and I don't know how I did it, <laughs> and I just did it. And then I took the model next day to the client and then to the commissioner, and they, they said, yeah, build it. And then I had to build it in three weeks, and I had never built anything like this before. So... Um, and I've always wanted, I wanted to use scaffolding, and scaffolding is really important to me, that it goes back into the system to use the scaffolding, not to just make things that are thrown away all the time. Um, and so then, I'm, I don't know why I wasn't scared, and I just thought, OK, we're going to make this. And, I've, and we just painted the whole project in my studio, and then we got the builders, and we, and we built the thing, and there, it, and there it was. And that was it. That was, I got the bug, and I, I, I realised also the impact that this had. Because when you make things, you make things for all the best reasons, but you don't know, always know why. And then they have to settle in themselves. And when you do temporary work, that's quite problematic because it doesn't often have enough time to settle into a community. It's there and then it disappears. But this actually ended up being there for 18 months. And, um, and people, a young group of people locally ran it and they had poetry evenings and then they just took it over and I, I don't live near Greenwich, I didn't go there very often so it, it wasn't, I wasn't feeling like I needed to oversee it or anything, I just wanted them to take it over and it for, to belong to them. And people still talk about it and they felt that it was started becoming part of their community and then it disappeared and and sadly, actually, the buildings on that site <laughs> are not that nice. Um, so it would have been better probably if they had kept that. So, but it started bringing the community together that hadn't happened before. And that was a very interesting thing for me. Um, Strong Love. Um, this one is, is another big, big uh, moment for me in 2014. So that's 2012, this is 2014. This is the Temple of Love on the South Bank. And um, for this brief, I was given, it was called Temple of Agape, that was the title. I was given Martin Luther King quote to use in any way I wanted. And I was given this space where I had to build something on some steps, round some trees, um, on a, and I had to bridge, take it up to the next level. I mean, it was the most complicated site ever. And, um, and I had been travelling in India in 2012, in Delhi. I actually went back there in January and it's completely changed. I couldn't believe it in 10 years. But there was this, they were just building this flyover, this concrete flyover, and there was this monkey temple. <laughs> and there was something about the juxtaposition of the concrete and the monkey temple and the colour that just just were, you know, just had, just had that contrast with that brutal environment with these, with this, this looks quite cartoony, but actually has been in Delhi for many, many years. And, um, and just, there was some, anyway, something I remembered in my head and it, I responded. And then when I did this piece, I was on a train one day and I, again, I, I find it quite difficult. To, I can't just sit down and do a piece of work. I have to wait for like three or four weeks. And people like Katu, I work with, knows she has to wait for me. It doesn't happen straight away. <laughs> I have to wait for a little while for the things to sort of just be inside me. And then I don't know where exactly the thing comes out of. Anyway, I did this drawing and then that drawing made me think I could make this uh, structure. And so then I took the structure and then again I showed it to the South Bank and they just said, you know, just make it. And, um, and this one they wanted... So these are my drawings. 
Um, I will work in, I, work I don't make models so much now, I work mainly in SketchUp, and Luke, who you saw a picture of him before, he often works with me in SketchUp, partly because I don't like using SketchUp that much, but um, so he builds the things with me, and, and now that's a much better process, because we work a lot around the world, we can then just give people the SketchUp and it makes it easier. For this one, I communicated everything in this way from the model. Um, and then I work with scaffolds. I, I, when you're working with scaffolding, you, sh you don't work with an engineer. If anybody thinks about it, don't work. They will build you, they will make you build it in a completely different way. You have to work with temporary scaffold engineers who, who um, know how to make these structures for you in a way that's much lighter. Because if you work with a normal engineer, it would be like super heavy and you'll have massive great big beams. So this is, but they're not used to working on things like this, but they're very adaptable. So, so, this, so then they drew the, drew the piece up for me from there. And then the South Bank, they wanted me to work with volunteers. And I don't actually agree with working, vol working with volunteers unless there is absolutely no budget on the project. And the people who are working on it will really get something from it, and that is the only way to do it. But if there is a budget, I think you should pay everybody to work with you. Um, but the South Bank um, wanted to go work with volunteers, so I, we put out, a, I think it was a tweet at that time, and all these people, people could come for a day, they could come for three weeks, they could come for however long they wanted to, and interestingly, a lot of them came for a day, they get their... Um, food and they would get their travel and I would show people how to paint. I was there all the time and um, a lot of people stayed for three weeks and it was really interesting. They got their roles in the studio. They decided to position themselves in things which was great. So then there was just this incredible group of people all the time coming in and out. Some people did just come for a day and then we made, again we did this in three weeks we painted the whole thing. We'd take a picture of everybody each day. So while that was going on, the structure was being built up on the South Bank, and we waited all the Kentledge. Because we were right next to the river, lots of problems with winds and stuff, so there was so much Kentledge water. We did it with water this time, just hidden inside the structure. And this is the piece. So totally hand-painted by us in the studio. It was mega. I mean, the more, the, the more I do these, the less I'm going to do another one because I realise how much it takes out of me. I think I've only got about five left in me. But, um, and, and what was so wonderful, though, all the people helped me paint it. I, you realise, actually, it is really good to get lots of people to help you paint because um, they get so much... You know, they really did feel part of the whole project and it, and it was as much theirs as it, is, it was mine. And this is the final piece. The only thing I would say that I regret um, is I didn't really want this staircase going through because I wanted it to be this space you'd come in off the, off the river where there were thousand, thousand people and it was a really contemplative space. So the outside, the concept of the whole thing is that's a peacock cock and it's outside saying look love is bright and colourful but inside it was all to do with natural light with no lot no colours it was about a contemplative place where love is not all the same throughout but then there was a request at the South Bank to make this stairwell and then unfortunately then people just walked through it so I never got the people sitting in the space but I learned from that, and I realised maybe I should have been stronger, and I, um, and I wouldn't let that happen again. Um, but, so, in here, after I made it, I didn't really realise where, where all the thoughts were. So, I had, I'd been in lots of temples and lots of places. I'm not religious at all, so this building was absolutely about love for everybody. It wasn't about... Um, a, a, any religion or anything. So it was about feeling a feeling as you go into places, though, um, where there is a, there is a, you do have some form of spiritual feeling or some other thing, and that's often by the fact that, that how the light comes into the space and how you feel in the space. So I did want to reflect. I did want a very different contrast from the outside to the inside. Um, so, looking and seeing, 
Um, I had this real thing about for uh, for about two years over the last two last year and the year before about the difference between looking and seeing and how it, it's so easy to look but much much harder to see and so I I sort of pursued this whole thing and and uh, this whole idea um, and and worked out so sorry I'll just show you these bits of things when I go around, I look at, I look and <laughs> see things. But it's about when you go to a place, like a child, this was in Saudi, this was so fascinating actually, because there's only, there's a white goat and a black goat, and so they make black and white stripes. So I thought that was a great reason to make black and white, and they make that real geometric stripe from a black goat and a white goat, and I thought that was, was really incredible. So these are just things that I collect and um, look at and um, see. <laughs> but I was asked, I've always wanted to go to South America. I'm actually going to Chile next week to do a talk, but I was always wanted to go to South America, and I, I, I didn't really know how to do a project there or anything. And, and some British Council people came, delegates came to my studio, and I showed them my work. And then in March... Uh, a really amazing group of, um, who did a design festival in Mexico City asked if I would do a big installation for them. And they offered me, uh, they didn't have enough money to send me to have a look at Mexico. I didn't really know Mexico, much about Mexico. So they offered me two sites. And one was this beautiful garden near the arts uh, museum. And the other one was this one. And now I know what Zocalo Square means, which is like the main a, a important square in the whole of Mexico. But at the time, I just thought, yeah, great. It's like all concrete. I like, you know, it's all stone and grey, and I could do something really brilliant there. So I chose this. I said to them, they sent me videos, and we did everything by Skype. And, and, um, and I thought, yeah, I really, really love that space. We're going to do it in there. They were excited about that. Then I've always liked the title of this book, Ways of Seeing, but I've never actually understood the book. <laughs> <laughs> I did try, but I've never understood it, but I like the title. And then when I was a little girl, I used to watch lots and lots of television as much as I could. And I remember this film, I remember this part of this film, and I couldn't actually remember the name, and now I've lost the name of the film, but I, uh, it's a Hitchcock film. I couldn't remember the name of the film, and then I had to search in my head what this film was, and then I found it. Hence weird French subtitles, I don't know. And it's a matter of life and death, or one of those. Mm. Mrs. Pitbull's duck stuck to her lips. She was on the eggs, and she's not careful. Ah, the start of the cycling season. There's a hefty young girl. Time is stuck around the generation. There she is. Oh, the vicar and sister not coming here, I hope. No, no. Quite a cure. The butchers must have some offer. Well, the one of the kids not playing in the splash. Just the same in my day. So I just remember this, this whole, this camera obscura and this, this whole way of um, bringing in such a simple way, he literally opens a door and, and then the light comes in and, and uh, the way of looking and it's a pinhole camera and in Mexico City um, I really wanted to make a piece that absolutely the whole, everybody could come to see this piece of work. And it wasn't in a gallery space, it was for, it was for everybody to see, which is not, people in Mexico City don't want to, a lot of people feel nervous about going to gallery spaces, they don't know what's there, so they, they avoid it. So to put something right in the middle of Zocala Square, to get people to look and see their environment around them in a different way um, than they than just passing by because they're used to it. So I, you know, me going to Mexico was just like a child. Everything was exciting, and I wanted people to see their um, their familiar environment in the same way. So these are some of the sketches. 
Ideally, we wanted to use a big lens, as he has in the film, but we went through the whole of Mexico. We could not get a lens. So in the end, we went back to the very basic, and I think that actually that was better in the end, and we did it as a pinhole camera. Um, and they, we were, they were sending us videos showing... <laughs> they were going, this looks great. Honestly, you couldn't see a thing. And I was like, going, oh, I'm not really sure this is really going to work. <laughs> we'll just have to trust them and see. So we did all these different sketches. And then this was the final piece. Um, so the whole, so this is right in the middle of the square. And if you know Mexico at all, there's one single road that cuts through the middle of Mexico City. And this sat right at the very end of that road. And literally, you could see it for miles. And underneath, it was, there was all swings so that everybody just felt very comfortable. They could just play on it. They didn't feel, why was this object here? And then people just queued but they didn't even know what they were queuing up for. <laughs> and because there was more clouds in Mexico than I realised, that they didn't always see that much. But what was so brilliant there, they, gave, they had a guy who explained everybody about how the pinhole camera, how we end up with a, you know, a camera in our phone, etc. Because people, what you realised is people didn't connect how film is, at, how images are produced. So that people would queue, they'd go in the middle, they'd be explained, and then they'd come out the other side, and then they could stay for as long as they like. And, um, but what was the biggest thing about this piece for me was, uh, so this is a pinhole camera, this is the image you see, obviously it's moving, it comes in upside down. There were lots of <laughs> interesting people who should have known better, who said, oh, we thought it would be black and white. It's like, right, okay. And, and it moves. Yeah, because it's the outside, it does move. So it was quite interesting how little people really knew. But the biggest thing for me was this was an, a really, fast, really amazing festival, but it had been inside in galleries. And then suddenly we did this massive people outside with loads of people queuing up to see it. So then the government suddenly decided they were going to do a big presentation with, you know, to come and see it in a royal, vi you know, a visit. And, and it absolutely changed everybody's attitude to the festival and what the festival could do to the city. So it is so important to get things out there and really surprise people. And this, this is my favourite the juxtaposition of the things. Now, interesting, my patterns do a little bit Aztec, but it was not intentional. I didn't really know until I got there that it was the main Aztec <laughs> part, the Mexican. Um, it was from, in, it's the grounds where all the Aztec, all the historical bit, and I didn't know that. So um, I now, naively, I feel a bit embarrassed about that because I should have known that, but my patterns were just the ones that I felt were right. So. We make belonging. So when I was talking about find how to um, uh, how do you make work that people feel like they belong to, because it's very dif difficult also when you're an artist and you're or designer and you're you're brought into um, people's environments, they might feel hostile to you. Why are you why are you doing it and somebody else is not doing it? I was doing a project for a library in West London, and I come from. No, North London, and I come from a little bit north. I, I come from Holloway, and this was a little bit further up north towards Finchley. And they said to me that I didn't, that I, they didn't want me to do it because I didn't come from there. <laughs> and it was like, well, I'm, I'm, like only, I'm only a bus ride away. Isn't that really far away? But, you know, they were like, well, you don't come from here. And I was like, okay, that's quite complex. Um, so, but you can see how people are protective of their communities, and that's absolutely right. People should be. So when you come in, you have to come in for a reason. Why are you coming in for, what is it, why do people you want you to do this particular project? And you have to prove yourself to people as well, because otherwise they, they're, not, they're not happy about it. So I um, have always been obsessed by bandstands. I, this is another film I used to watch a lot of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Um, and I love this film, um, Top Hat. I think it's Top Hat. Oh, anyway, I'm not very good on names, but anyway, I love this film. And um, because I love this bandstand, and I love the fact that they're in the middle of a park in the middle of the night, and they're just on this bandstand, and they're doing their dance. And I just love bandstands because they're, they're, they're public performance spaces. And I love this film. Um, 
So I was obsessed with bandstands, and every which way I'd try and get somebody to let me make a bandstand. I even made models of bandstands. I tried every roof of a bandstand, and I almost got one through, and then it, it didn't happen. And then, so I had to park my bandstands for a little while. And then there's um, Ditchling, where Eric Gill um, lived, um, and, but lots of other people, fortunately, lived in this area as well, not just Eric Gill. And there, there's a museum there, Museum of uh, Art and uh, Craft, and they were in, the director asked me to come down and said, would you be interested in doing a project? What do you want to do? And I said, what do you think? I said, I want to make a bandstand. And I want to make a belonging bandstand. And he goes, well, actually, Mike, that's quite good because um, we've got, we're doing an exhibition on um, Carita Kent, and we really think that there's, there's a connection between the two of you. And so, um, you know, we think this is a good fit. So what we'll do is we'll try and see if we can raise the money to do the bandstand. And, um, and then I thought, well, I knew Corita Kent's work, and, but I'm a bit of a person who does look at things and doesn't always read everything. So, you know, I knew her work and I'd seen it in various places. I actually only first saw her work in 2007 in St. Ives. I didn't know her before that. So when, I was think when they were pairing me with her, I thought, oh, God, I better read. I better read something. And um, so I read all the things, uh, read lots of... I bought, lo I bought, like, that many books off Amazon, and I read all these different bits about other people talking about her. But then I got this book. Oh, my God, everybody has to buy this book. It is amazing. It is her teaching. It, it, she, just before she died, um, she wanted to... Um, well sort of 10 years before she died, she wanted to make this book. And actually, I think it was um, published after she died with Jan Stewart, who was one of her students. So she was an ed educator, an activist, um, based in Los Angeles, was friends with the Eames and everybody, and I'm sure lots of people know her work. But this book is her teaching. And, um, and when I read it, there were so many things in there that maybe I was taught by similar people, I don't know, but that whole thing about looking and seeing, about um, seeing things as a child, about going back and trying, um, making yourself do things that are not as controlled as you used to do, etc. So I thought, well, when I do these workshops, I'm going to um, take... Um, so to do... Sorry, I'll go back a bit. So my bandstand... The way I wanted my bandstand to do this belongings bandstand was to work with nine different um, communities and down in East Sussex, so um, some in Hastings and uh, some in New Haven. So there were lots of different places. We worked with all these different groups. And so I was trying to think of the best way to do these workshops, and I wanted to understand what belonging meant to each of these groups. So I went through her book, and I picked out some exercises the way she did them, and then we did some of um, the way I did things. And, and so we did lots of... So we did all these workshops in different places. This one, we got two community groups to come to Ditchling, and they absolutely loved it, and I think partly because we gave them lots of cakes as well, so they really loved it, and it was all these different age groups, all these different abilities, everybody can join in, even if you have dementia, or, uh, you know, it's, it's not, there isn't a particular type of person or anything, it's about everybody having an opinion and being part of it, and so these are, so we were getting the words about what belonging meant to them, and Carita Kent does this thing with using magazines, and she did used to include the Bible. I didn't put the Bible in. Um, and then in New Haven, it's a very different group. There's all these young people who have moved to New Haven because it's, it's much cheaper for them to live there, and so then they wanted to sort of bring their community together, and they put a festival on as well. So these were the words that came out. So what I did is we, we got everybody to edit their words, and then I asked them what colours meant to them, what things meant to them, and then I responded and, and drew these, made these placards for them. Although I got this wrong because they said to me that I had obviously um, not been to Hangleton because it's all got hills in it and I made it look like it was flat. So I was reprimanded for that one. So, um, and then I worked with Brighton University and they helped me paint all the placards. And then finally, because we had really super, super tight budget. The rest of the um, bandstand I painted in my studio on my own. 
Um, and then this is the bandstand. So each placard, each group, it toured to nine different, to the nine different communities. They each had it in their space. And then their placards went on the front each time. But this was for the Brighton Festival. It was on the seafront. It's quite nice juxtaposition with the, um, the, uh, the, the, whatever the thing is out there. Sorry, <laughs> I was a bit nervous. Um, but this was the one that I was the most moved by, because that's a community centre over there, and they were doing amazing theatre work in the community centre. But then when we put the bandstand outside, and it was a nice day, we were there, everybody gravitated to the bandstand. Many, many people who ne don't come out of their um, places, they all came together and started chatting together, and they were, all, they were saying, oh, we really, really want the bandstand to stay. And I said, but... It isn't about the bandstand staying, it's about the fact the bandstand has arrived. And when I was a child, I really, well, you can tell from my work that circuses and fun, fun fairs, I really loved in Holloway if the fun fair came at the bank holiday and we'd all go and have candy floss and stuff. And, you know, so there is that thing, there is good to have permanence in maybe something like the Movement Cafe, but something like this, it's much more about coming and people look forward to it and then it goes away. And also they don't have the maintenance and all that. That gets all very complex. Um, so United, so then the, the bandstand ended and, um, and it was, the placards went back, went to all the groups and then nobody wanted the bits I did. <laughs> So I've got them. <laughs> I keep them in my. I've got them in my studio. So I've got two storage spaces full of things that I couldn't because when we did the Temple of Agape, they were just going to throw it all away, and I just said you can't. You just can't do that. And we really must be conscious of things like that now. We shouldn't just make those things and throw them away. I mean, I think in a way, temporary is is problematic because of that. So we always, you know, e the wood should just be given somebody else to paint over it and do another project or something if it's not kept for any reason. I think we need to be very conscious. Um, with this project in Graz, they sold all the bits off to various people, just the people who were involved for, for not very much money. So in Graz, there's this really co um, hardcore arts festival called Steerbicker Hisps. The festival was about migration, it was about open doors, but sadly this is 2016. The day, um, the day we started doing this project, um, Brexit happened, and I was there one night, and Iceland were playing against England, and honestly I was the worst, even if Iceland isn't in the EU. <laughs> It was, wor I, it was worse because I was British and I was over there and it was really not, you know, they were not happy with us because also I was saying, because I was doing this integrated project and I was like going, but it's all about everybody being together and we're all together and then this thing happened. And I was like, I mean, it's not me, I never chose it, you know, but they, there was, it was quite strange towards British at that time. Um, and so, um, but anyway, I did the migratory project and I went to all these different groups and these young guys at a youth centre, um, we had to pay them five euros because they, they wouldn't have done a sticker uh, patterns otherwise. But actually, it was, really, it, it was really fascinating when they were given things to do and they really concentrated and the gang leader concentrated on it the most. He made this pattern. Oh, I'm not allowed to walk across here, sorry. This pattern. And um, which you can see had all hearts and everything. And he, um, so it, and it was brilliant. And you could see a whole different side when you gave these projects to people to do. And in and this one also, I worked with, um, in one group where there was a completely blind lady. And I was like, I'm not sure. I don't know how to do that. And, but the woman who was with me, so showed me, she, we folded the paper and we had the stickers and then she touched the stickers and then she made this pattern and it was amazing, I can't believe, it was, I think it was, it might not have been up there actually, it was, I did make it, so what I do is I take their patterns and then I redraw them and very true to their patterns, you would be able to, if I put the two next to it, you'd, you'd see their patterns. Um, but, so, so then these were banners in the, street, it, it lined the streets in Graz. So this project was about 
it was the arts group saying, look, you have to be more together in this city because it's too divided and you shouldn't have ghettoed areas, you should all come together. But all the different cultures also needed to come together. So this place had all these open doors and it was around the socialist workers building in the People's Park. And there was an arts group and then what they did is each cultural group would make food every few um, each week, I think it was up for three months, and then they'd share their recipes and then all the people would come and all the international people would come and they would show that there was a way forward of being much more integrated than this city had allowed in the past. And it, was, and it won actually quite a lot of awards because it did bring people together. Um, so... Another thing is, I think it's really important to um, sometimes do things just because they're fun, and this was in um, South Africa. Quite problematic for me also, though, that this was a massive, great big piece of work, and it was only there for three days. That was really problematic for me, um, when you're in a country that there's so many extremes, and then you're building this big thing. Um, so I said to him, the only, only way I build this thing is that, that the finished, the, the panels will go somewhere. And so they find this amazing group of people who work with the townships in South Africa and they took all the panels and they reused those panels in cladding buildings, putting it in a new library, a library that had burnt down and been rebuilt. So then that was okay. I, I, I felt that was all right. I don't, you know, I, I don't think you should deprive people of having f fun, but at the same time, I also think you've got to be careful. You've got to balance <coughs> things out and, and not be so extravagant in one place. It, it doesn't feel right. In a place that suffers from an incredible amount of um, poverty. So, uh, so this was the piece, and it was just for people to hang out and play on, and it was, you know, obviously for me it was great because I could express myself, embrace the unknown, and then this is how it was used. So they, you, they, I didn't have any say in it, I just let them do whatever they wanted. They made tables out of it, they covered the things, they, the kids made their um, uh, goals and all sorts of things. So it was great that there was reuse for it. And I am doing another project in South Africa, actually, called Africa Burn. Again, this will not be burnt. My piece won't be burnt. Um, this is the piece, and I've designed this with Luke, and we've, we've done the whole thing, and then the group over there, there's a group, and they're just making it. They just wanted to make a piece of my work. And so I was like, okay. They keep on wanting me to go to Africa Burn. I better say, yes, I am going. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure. I, I'll see how I feel. But um, I think, you know, these people are paying... They've been doing it for the last year and a half, and they've raised money to do it, and they want to make this piece of work. But again, they, they are... Again, it's, it's, it's for fun. It's just a, an indulgent thing, but they're going to then... Um, they have aligned schools to have the pieces afterwards. So making things last. So I have been talking about temporary work, and... And temporary work is really fantastic because you can, um, nobody really call, you can do what you, it's like a magazine or something, it, it's there and then it will disappear. So you can be very, very experimental and you can play around and you can try really extreme things. And, um, and, and then when you, um, <laughs> this one was really scared me though. Um, this, is the other one going to, so I wanted this, um, slide. I didn't actually know there were going to be children at this festival and then there were all these children in this festival and then they could all fall down the side and I was just like, oh my god, I'm going to kill all these children. And, then <laughs> I, you know, and, and they were going whizzing, they were like trying to get the fastest tray they could go off it and then they could go off there and they were like this big and I was like, you never told me there were children at this festival. And, um, and then so the next year I got them to get rid of the slide because I was just having heart attacks. So then we rebuilt this uh, structure. This is in Romania, a festival in Romania. And um, they built it, we draw it all, and they build it all for us. And, and I, I didn't get involved in the painting or anything. And they build it and we, re we build it up and build it up. So no, we got rid of the slide. Um, this is a piece about joy and peace. It was in London and this was very much about 
because there had been this 2017 and we'd had lots of bombings in London and it was really important to try and make a piece of work that addressed, you know, th that London wasn't falling apart, that, <laughs> you know, that joy, there is joy and, and, and peace is important. So I just wanted to make this piece that was colourful and, um, and positive. And this was built out of, so all pa hand painted in my studio, all cut and then built these. You can see how big those pieces were. I paid people to work with me on this project and then we built it from scaffolding out of the car park. And they were put in schools. This was um, a project, Swing It, we did in Barnsley um, at the Orangery, at uh, no, Wakefield, sorry, Wakefield at the Orangery. Um, this was in Vegas. And um, I went out to Vegas and they asked me to do this project for Life is Beautiful. This piece actually now is in storage, they're going to reuse. Oh my God, they were going to get me people to help me and then they didn't and I had to do it in six days with Luke helping me. I had one nurse and her daughter help me and this was the piece and I had to do it in six days. It nearly killed me. I had to actually lie down for a year after that because, I'd, I'd, because that year I'd built seven... I'd built, um, the four really big things and this was the last one and I was just like, I don't want to ever paint. Um, and because just be, this is an old motel and just behind the motel is where we were and nobody in Vegas wants to paint outside because it's too hot. And this was it at night. So I used neon, so it's all water-based paints. I won't use spray and I was just talking to somebody recently who uses spray and they said, um, a commissioner and loads of guys, loads of people use spray and they are having uh, respiratory problems. So just warn everybody, be careful, <laughs> you know, use your masks and stuff like that. I won't use spray. I used to in the past, but I won't. So everything is water-based paints. This is um, neon water-based paints, which probably does have some stuff in it, but I'm not breathing it in in that same way. It's just got a black light there. So there's no lighting on there. Uh, on the other pieces of artwork, there's lighting, but my one has just got a black light on at night, and you probably recognise the other artist, Akudo, um, and he's a very famous Panton over there. But then, at the same time, you can do very small things. So I was asked by a community group in Hackney, would, they ha would I help them make this stage? And so I just did, I, I did the patterns with the, with the groups, and the, I took their patterns, and then I built it into a the stage for them. We did it with no money at all and we made it happen. So you don't need to always to have <coughs> lots of projects. But sometimes, so now people say to me, can you do permanent? And I say, um, well, now I've done some, but they don't trust you. They think you can only do temporary. Do you know how to make permanent? So I was asked to do this one at Battersea Power Station. Um, this is the... Um, Festival of Britain, I'd love to have been able to see that, the Battersea um, Pleasure Gardens, I never saw that, but look at those amazing buildings. Um, so this was my response to that uh, project. I like the Art Deco, I like the whole sort of Festival of Britain, and, um, and so this was not really a connection to me, this, this was really a, a response to a place, and nobody had done an artwork there, it was a new opening to Battersea Power Station, so I thought I'm going to own the word power. So then we made it in the studio. This is my happy dance, always if I finished a piece of work. <laughs> and then this is what, this was really big for some, for these sorts of people who built all these things to get me to do this very bright coloured piece. But I was talking on Saturday with um, Battersea Power Station and they are really, really proud of this piece of work. I didn't want to paint it because if you do permanent work, you've got loads of insurances and things like that. And I didn't want to paint it. I didn't want to take on those insurances. But when, they sh when all the contractors showed me how they painted the work, I was like, no way. <laughs> I'm going to have to paint it. So I got the contractor to build all the wooden sections for me. Then they sent them to me to the studio. And then I had a team of people. We painted them. And this is all tiled. And it's been there two years now. And it's right next to the Thames, which is always a problem. All just hand-painted. Loads of fire retardant you have to do and things like that but just varnished and it's absolutely fine. So don't be forced sometimes. Sometimes when you're doing a project like this, they'll go, oh, it's got to be metal cladding, it's not going to last, you know. This is made from um, FSC rated marine ply, which you make boats out of. So if a boat lasts and it's look, looked after well enough, that wall is going to last, you know. So I think, but you have to do lots of experiments. 
And then this is a very big departure for me. Um, but th it's actually, even though it's in an office building, this is now a public space. So it's in Broadgate. It's in a building that, that used to be unpenetrable. It was like a trading floor. And now they're opening it up. And so I've made... So this was... I don't do CGI's. This was a CGI that was made um, because people were too scared of my drawings. Um, and then, but this is the actual thing. It's only just open, that's why no people in here. So <laughs> hopefully some people will come, as we say. Um, and the whole idea, this was because I come from Finsbury Park and I lived in a terrace house, and this is in Finsbury Avenue in the city. And in the past, the parks were made for the city workers to go out. So I wanted to bring this, this, the park into the city. So this is all real plants. And then we've done, we made all handmade, all the furniture which you can't see, um, with loads, and it's all planting. So, but it, it is really, really important. It's a public space. Anybody can come and use the electricity. So how am I doing? 43 minutes. Do you want to stop for questions, or do you want me to carry on a little bit longer? Or should I carry on? What would you like? Just five minutes and then questions. The questions? Uh, five minutes more. Five minutes more. OK, five minutes more. I think I can do it in five minutes. OK, so. My mum and dad met in Aberdeen. My dad saw my mum at the top of the stairs. He got, fell in love with her, and then, you know, I came along. Well, and my sister came along. Love at first sight. God, that's a horrendous thing to live with the rest of your life, that the only time you can meet somebody if you fall in love with them straight away, which isn't true. You don't need to do that. But I did think you had to. Anyway, um, my, a year and a half ago, and, um, sadly, my, my, my dad's not with us anymore. My mum had just died in December of that year. And... Um, and, these, and they rang me from Aberdeen, and where my mum and dad met. And I'd never ever spoken to anybody in Aberdeen. And I was like going, so this is a bit weird. Like, my mum, <laughs> this is this place that has always been where my mum and dad had this amazing romance. Because my dad was on the ballet tour with um, the Royal Ballet, and, he, and so this was a very, like, chance meeting. So they said to me, oh, my, we do this festival up in Aberdeen. We really would like you to come and... Um, make an installation and we want you to we want people to see the the local people to show out out in the streets and um could you do this so i was like oh this is quite weird you know i'm still i'm very emo you know i'm not crying today but i cry a lot and um, i'm quite emotional about my mom and everything and so but then i went up there and i realized because my mum's scottish i realized that i'm actually more scottish than i think i am <laughs> and i've got lots of my um when i was with lots of people from aberdeen i was like oh we all yeah i'm really sim i'm not as london as i thought and um and we really came together and there was an idea to work with the local dialect Doric in Aberdeen. And so I said, well, I love working with poets. Can I work with a Doric poet? And so I, we, we did with Jo, and it was amazing. And um, she, so we sat down, and originally what they wanted, their brief to me was there's this place called Castle Gates, and they wanted me to think of how I could activate that that space and at that time I didn't really think oh I'd do a whole project about my mum and dad I you know that was sort of a bit strange but when we sat down and I start and we talked with the poet between us in the end we just it was like well it's got to be about your mum and dad's meeting because this was a meeting place as well Castle Gate and it was like yeah of course I don't know why that wasn't like instant so the whole piece was about meeting. Then the poet wrote a piece about my mum and dad's story. And then she worked with the community. And this is us painting. She worked with the community to write a, a story about what Aberdeen means to them and meeting and things like that. And then I couldn't stay in Aberdeen for three weeks. So I went up and I um, showed Joe, Gannon and Susie, she, they're around that, um, how to paint and how to run the whole group and how to do the piece. And... 40 people, in the, that was one of the uh, groups, but in the end, 40 people over three weeks painted the whole piece for me. And, well, for us, for, for all of us, for the community. And then this was a piece, and if you know Aberdeen at all, it's a very grey stone, and, so, and this is right at the end of the main street, so you could see it from everywhere. And then, but the thing was, the poem they wrote was so long, it was like 500 words, and I was like going up, 
oh my God, I'm like super stressed out because I wanted to do it all perfectly and put it all on the thing. And I was like, oh my God, I'm really out of my comfort zone here now. So I'm going to have to work out how am I going to get all these words onto something. So in the end, I, I did it in a very different way than I usually do, but I really love doing it. So I put one phrase at the top and then I hand painted all the other things. And then on site, I hand painted, um, I hand wrote the whole poem, the big po This was the poem that was written about my mum and dad, and then this was the poem about the city. And it was just incredible, the impact this had on people. They just came up to me and they talked to me, their stories, who they met, when they'd met their, if they'd had their wedding there, that they, that they knew that there was art in the city, but they didn't realise where it was, they wanted more of these things. It was an amazing, amazing form of communication. And, um, and again, that was okay, it didn't have to stay there, it started the dialogue, which is the most important thing. And I hope that Look and Gen Fest Festival and the, and the um, city will see the value of these amazing art groups in the city because what they were doing is they were spending a lot of money getting a street artist from Holland or something and around the world coming in and they'd given them all the money. And what we were trying to do is say, look, you've got amazing people here. They c they'll get people in as well, but they can also nurture all the people in the city and not just give your money out to a com you know, a something abroad. Then what we also did, this is my mum's work, um, we had an exhibition of my mum's work. So, because my mum taught a great school of art, so it all came together. So, the last thing I want to talk about, yes, I've got two, one minute, is Sheffield Children's Hospital. So, I've worked with Kat, and Kat actually saw me speak at a talk <laughs> at your university, at Sheffield Hallam, and, um, and then got me to do the project, didn't you, Kat? And Kat's from um, Art Felt in Sheffield. And Kat had this commission. I've done lots of projects in hospitals, but I've never been allowed in bedrooms because I'm too scary. And, um, and it did almost prove to be that way, but we managed to get through it, didn't we, Kat? And we made these bedrooms, and now they're in... If you go to the hospital, you can see they're in action, and as I understand, they're very positive feedback. Is, and they're recovering quicker as well, so that's pretty good. But what I... Um, Everybody, I love the teddy bear. <laughs> I styled it. No, I didn't style it. I love the day. <laughs> I love the teddy bear on the thing. So these are the bedrooms. But what was interesting was, um, as well, on top of this, is uh, I did a project for Method, and when Method, the cleaning products, um, asked me to do this project, I said I would like to have done a project with the patients at Sheffield, and so that was the direction we were going to go. And then they ran out of time, and they said, "Why will you do it?" So I said, "Yeah, okay, but the only way I'll do it is if you give me some money to do the garden, the the garden in Sheffield Children's Hospital. What is a garden? What is it? Is a terror courtyard. courtyard? The courtyard, because in all the building works they did, in the end there was no money left to." do the courtyard. So, um, so they said, um, yeah, okay. And then when we, I was signing the contract, they were paying me a little bit less money, and I thought, right, I'm not going to do this. But then I have actually agreed with them to give me some money. So what I did is I made them put in writing that they were going to, I'd take the money they offered me, and I would, uh, as long as they would give me the money for the courtyard. And yes, they did give us some money for the courtyard. And um, oh, this is another bit of as well. So I did these crossings in London that in the end were rejected by Sadiq Khan um, because they brought a policy out saying that they couldn't do coloured crossings or something. So these were all made. They were all made, ready to go. So I remembered about, um, about a few months ago, I thought, well, these all exist. I know they all exist, and they're just in storage. So let's ask the p if we can have those. So we're getting these to go into the um, courtyard as well, and the guys who, who made them... Um, we'll just charge us some money to put them down. So we've managed to get this as well for free, which is great. So this is the courtyard existing. And these are the plans. Whoa. Oh, for the courtyard. <laughs> 
And it's going to get that way. We've got the planting in place and we're just getting all the things together. So I feel, so I think there's a lot of things with artists, with brands at the moment. And I just think if there was another way of doing that and then getting some money, they, those people have lots of money and they want to do good things. So they should do real good things and give money for other projects. Because to them, 20,000, 30,000 isn't a lot of money. And this is the last thing. I just did this the other day. So now I'm doing a project in Hong Kong, which is quite complex at the moment with obviously all the riots going so may happy those who are near is quite weird but they're still okay about it because I started this earlier um, and um, and this is the piece I'm making in um, Hong Kong um, for and it's gonna have it I'm working with a, a uh, an artist from Hong Kong who's interactive inside so there you go <laughs> and that's Elvis He's a bit bigger now. Okay, so I did go over a bit, apologies. Um, have you got questions, please, anybody? Or is there anything? I'll just put it on, let me just see if I can see this, sorry. I'll leave it on that. Um, your style's amazing. Like, I love the way that your fashion, your, your fashion sense like, reflects everything. Like Scooby-Doo today. Yeah. <laughs> um, how, did you, like, what came first? The fashion, the colour, like, or was it just everything about growing up was just like surface to fair and then it just kind of was or? I don't... <laughs> I think it took me... I mean, people will know, my, I've worked with lots of architects and environments and things like that, and the work that I would have probably shown before was a whole other work, a, a whole other part of my life, because I've been doing things for a long time. So, um, so I've always, so I think that um, there's always been all this in me, but it ne but when, I don't want to, talk, it's a bit, I'm, I'm nervous about, separating design and art and things like that but when I was very much a designer I did I never really expressed myself I tried to solve things for people and I was very very good at it so I would feel like I was um, a method actor or something I take on the role of that whatever I was working for so but I was very frustrated so it took me a really long time to feel confident enough to actually go no I'm this, I'm going to be me, and that's where I changed. Because people always thought my company was Studio Myscope. They always thought there were loads of people working for me because I wanted to, people to think of it that way. And then I realised nobody actually realised that I was doing it. <laughs> so I then changed it, and then um, so then people understood that it was more Ag Myscope, and and I, I did it. So it's been a very long process for me. The world has changed for me for the better. Um, and but it took me a long time to be able to express myself in the way I am, and 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 I think that's because the world has changed as well. Anybody got a hand? No. no, I have one. Oh. Um, so you said uh, you were always really wanted to make a band stand, mm. and you were successful in that. People keep on asking me things <laughs> like that. Um, it's really weird. I sort of the bandstand was, and now um, I don't have a massive yearning for anything in particular because I have these just weird things when emails pop up in my um, in my you know I get an email that and they ask me to do some weird thing in the middle of nowhere or somewhere and then I just go yeah maybe that's what I really wanted to do so um, I am doing a really incredible project which I couldn't show you in Manchester and um, at the moment that is that project it's a it, it was originally going to be temporary but it's going to last 10 years now that is something where I'm incorporating planting into a stage, into a thing. It's a massive, massive, it's Mayfield just as you come out of the station. So that is a massive, massive project. And at the moment, I can't really go beyond that. That, that is what I wanted to do, although I hadn't known that I wanted to do it uh, before somebody contacted me. So um, I just sort of go with the flow. <laughs> 
Any more questions? Oh. Does, does the, um, the way that people respond to each one make you change the way you do the next one? Do you keep changing? Do you learn from Yeah, I do. I, I make a point of um, sitting in the installations wherever possible and observing or sitting away from you know so people don't know it's me as such you know and I go back to the installations when they're there and I try and see how they're being used and um, and and also you know is it just a idea that if people paint it you know do they feel like they're part of it or do they actually do think they are and and I and because it's quite um a mission to paint one of those things and it's one that people go up and down with it but at the end of it was amazing in Aberdeen because everybody felt like they'd all come together and they made it and it's quite also quite good that I'm not there as well so they're sort of just doing it themselves and they're making this thing and making this massive thing in the middle of the city so I learn all the time from each project yeah and then they, that does feed into other projects yeah Yeah, so the colours are quite interesting because more recently I have been working with a palette of colours. Not the, um, the project I just showed you uh, is tiled, um, the one that was in the office building, that looked like an office building, the one at the very end. And I had all those tiles printed in Stoke-on-Trent. And so all the, the, those colours, tiles, have limitations. You can't get pinks. You can only get a sort of purple. You can't get bright pink. You can get pale pink. You can't get, you know, so, some, so in a way, the, sometimes the material can leak, will slightly control your colours. But um, at the moment, it took me a really long time. I experimented with colours for a very long time. But currently, I am working with a, with a palette. And then I bring in different colours at different times. But there probably is a bit of a palette, but I'm, it, it evolves all the time, you know, and I, and I like, I love putting pastels with bright to see, it's all about how optically it changes the space and the colours. And the moment you put neon and then it messes all the colours up because your eye can't, read, you know, can't work with it very well. Um, but I like that too. So, yeah, I, I, it's evolved. My colours have evolved. They're not really based on anything and or anything in particular you know I don't have any theories people always ask me theories of color don't have any of those I just do it <laughs> um, I mean I think I think you answered it in your in your presentation but I was wondering how you balance having uh, such a distinctive style um, with kind of other people's spaces if that makes sense um, how you incorporate your, yourself into those spaces without seeming like an alien that's just landing, if that makes sense. Yeah, but maybe an alien landing is all right, actually. You know, uh, so for me, th there's no use... It doesn't work if you put my work in the middle of a shopping centre or something like that. It's wrong. You know, the more brutal, the more austere, the better the, the work responds to it. Um, so... If, as I had been, <laughs> when I did Battersea, um, they did ask me, they did say to me at one point, um, you know, can you make it a bit less bright? <laughs> and I just said to them, go to another artist, because <laughs> this is what I do. You either have what I have, what I do, or you don't have it. I'm not, I'm not, and so they went, oh, yeah, okay, that is why we chose you. So, um, <laughs> and, and I, but I do respond, it's all about the light, it's, you know, the, the, the work, uh, and also it's a materiality of my work, because I really like the wood, and the wood um, brings in this softness that's di that has a different feeling. So, and so the piece that I've just completed with the tiles, and all the furniture is handmade, it's all made of wood with metal legs, and then all the planting in this very sort of... Um, warehouse but slightly slicker building so it's about 
whereas they would normally have really expensive sofas and stuff like that. So it was about actually putting that juxtaposition, you know, doing that alteration and getting people... And I like it if people don't like my work as well. Like that piece, um, they liked everything about it, which I thought the other bits were a bit more weird than the bit they didn't like. But because um, the thing they didn't like, and I can say, they didn't like the suns on the top, right? They didn't mind anything. Everything was all right except for the suns. And it was like, so what's your problem with the suns? And they they going, we just don't we just don't um, get the, we don't get the suns. But the suns are part. Of, sun symbolizes joy to me. That symbolizes energy. Sun is life. And I I you know there are things that I have to have. So it went to right to the top, and they're all like going, we can't we don't want the suns. And, and so, and even the architects was like going, please, can you just get rid of the sons? And I, and I said, no. You e and then I sat in the meeting and I said, you, e you either do the sons or you don't do the piece. And you just got to trust me. And then they did it. And of course, now they love the sons. <laughs> because if you walk on those balconies above, all you can see is these rooftops with the plants growing up and the suns. And, it, and so it's also about considering when you're working in space, you know, who's going to see it from there? That was the first time I came across that was with the South Bank because that was being seen from absolutely everywhere. There was no hidden moment. Every single thing from everywhere, you had to, you, you had to consider that somebody was going to see it. And the same with this. Try, sadly, the people in the cafe haven't quite thought that through. So I am <laughs> forever, so I want them to change um, because there's like a right mess down there. Um, but, you know, so it's, and it's for each, pe you know, all these different people. This is now a co working space. It's an interesting thing. It's in the city, so entrepreneurial people can go in there at lower price. You know, they can, u they can use the downstairs and the electricity to having meetings, or anybody can come from the street. Nobody would stop them. Um, so, yeah, so I find it strange things that people object to. They don't really know why. They, they didn't have a reason. They were just like, oh, don't think we like those. Anyway. So. Could I ask you what mm. the, um, on the inside of the Aberdeen piece? Yes. Tape? Yeah, so I use rib. So that's kite fabric that I get made into ribbon. So that's quite a sign. I use that quite a lot in my work. Um, and I literally, no, I, I literally, me and another girl just wrapped it in the rain because the guy who was building that Aberdeen project, <laughs> I've met him before and we showed him the project. Everything's drawn to scale. I am meticulous. I mean, that is the thing about having done graphic design. I am, everything is systems, there's all systems because I have to leave things for people to be able to, so everything is numbered, it's systems, you know, I am very meticulous. And um, anyway, this guy who was building it, he, because in the end, the, um, the type on the top, is it, is it this way or is it that way? No, it's this way. The type on the top was meant to go much higher, and they were like, everybody was like, oh, we can't put the type really high. I was like, oh, my God, really? And I made this quite low. I mean, this is really low for me. This is only five metres, and it was meant to sit right on the top, and they were all petrified, and I was like, okay, all right, then. We'll do it lower. But one of the lead carpenter guy, he was really scared going up the scaffolding. So then when we were, in, when we were doing the insides of it, uh, um, I was just like, who the hell am I going to get to tape all this? Because this was like three, meet, four, three and a half metres. So me and this other girl just had to, one had to stand at one end and the other stand at the other end and we just balanced and we just pulled the tape across and pulled the tape. Because there's a point where you think, if I don't do this, it's not going to get done. So I'm just like, <laughs> so, and we got it done and it was actually was quite rewarding. We enjoyed ourselves even though it was raining and my, my feet froze off. But, um, and this was summer. No, this was June. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so it literally is hand done, and then we tie it, and I get it cut um, for it. But it's a good way of hiding. I love the scaffolding, <coughs> but it also gives an internal space with the scaffolding without boarding it all out. Do you have any worries about the Hong Kong piece, that it's going to be too bright around your piece, that almost you should do it in grey? Oh, no, in, no, the particular place I'm, it's in is not. It's, a, it's an art, it is a detour, it's an open space, but it's a sort of co-working um, young person's art space, so it's in a big open area, which is just stripped back, and so it won't be. But interestingly, 
that has been a, a very in, a big learning curve for me because I am, I showed you, I sort of skipped through it a bit, but I showed you the scaffolding and I am absolutely obsessed by bamboo scaffolding. So I'm in Hong Kong and then I go, well, obviously, I've got to make it out of bamboo scaffolding it's, and it's the most sustainable material, you know, blah, 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 I want to make it. Um, and um, I did the design with this with um, using the scaffolding in a sort of interesting manner, the bamboo, and then, and it was all okay, and then they said no. They said it was too much like it was a Chinese piece of work, and they didn't want me to do it. And that's why now I've got this more enclosed. And, and you normally, as with my sons, I would absolutely fight against that, but because I could feel there was a cultural issue, you know, that I was, even though I was just using the material of the, of the city, but actually they don't use bamboo very much. There's only two bamboo people in Hong Kong, and so they, it is actually implying a culture that they don't want to be necessarily at the moment. So, you know, so it was so complex that I just felt, all right, then I'll back off on that one, and I rebuilt it, I rebuilt the whole thing, and they wanted it to be, because I had it much more open and much more planted and really showing off the bamboo, but, so my chance of, because in Austria previously I tried to <laughs> do a big bamboo, because that was crossing continents, the, the job before the one I did, I wanted to do a big bamboo thing and I couldn't get bamboo into Austria and I couldn't get people to put bamboo and it was going to cost like 5 million and I had 50,000 euros and it was like, no, I can't do this. So, so maybe one day I'll be able to, I think more likely I'll be able to do a bamboo project here now because people see the value of bamboo. So I think it will come more here. Um, and it is an amazing material, but that's still... So, yeah, maybe I want to do a project with bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody, when I said, what do I want to do? Yeah. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, if that's okay. Mm? Any preference between uh, indoor projects and outdoors projects? And how does it relate to what you said at the beginning, needing more space and trying to find your place in life? Mm. Definitely for me, outdoor projects, because um, I like people just for, I, I really believe art is for absolutely everybody, and I believe that if it's out in the street, then absolutely anybody can see it. If it goes within a building, then that changes the dynamics of it. So um, I... And the first time I did saw that very much is when I worked with London College of Communication and I, ch I worked with the students and transformed the outside. And I put some neon on the window and this woman just came by and she was like going, oh, thank God there's some colour. I don't even care that she didn't even know what I was doing or anything. She just loved the colour that, that, that wasn't in that area. So I like the idea that they, I like layering my work and people can take it on, most people take it on the colour and the pattern, but there's also loads and loads and loads of different things in it. And so I like the idea that some people get different things. It doesn't matter what people get from it. You know, and even if they get that they don't like it, that's okay because at least they're looking at, so they're reacting to something and they're responding to something and it make them think about something that you know, they hadn't thought about before. And so, yes, definitely outside. <laughs> Long answer. <laughs> yeah. 